for now. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and crack them open to the second chapter of 2 Timothy. You're going to get excited because I know that sometimes when I come up here, I have a habit of going a little bit long. But that's because I so often just have so much rich material to work with. But today, we're actually only covering the first two verses of chapter 2. So if you pray hard enough, we might get out on time. <laughs> but within these two verses, man, there is, there is this powerful, even if it's just a brief encouragement from Paul to his beloved friend, his beloved son, Timothy, not just to stay strong in the faith, which we have seen throughout 2 Timothy already, but to really grab onto that faith and, and, and pass it on to other people. Other people who are going to be capable teachers who might then pass it on to another generation of believers. And I hope as we get into these two verses in 2 Timothy that we'll get a chance to really talk about the importance that this encouragement has to our lives, not just as individual believers, but really as the body, as the family of Rockridge Church. And, and what Paul is outlining here, I hope we come to see as, as really the reproductive mechanism of the church, which is something that we should all feel called to participate in. Again, in these two, these two verses, there's a lot of power in this encouragement. There's, there's a big sort of powerful nugget in this encouragement from Paul to Timothy that is so relevant for the church today. Since it's so brief, I'll go ahead and read the verses to you. And if you have the Bible with you, you can read along. Paul writes to Timothy, You then, my child, be strengthened by a grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's it. That's the whole thing. But we do have to sort of revisit the story, I think, to get everything out of this that we can. You have to remember where Paul, where and when sort of Paul is when he writes this final appeal to his beloved friend and, and co-worker Timothy. Remember, Paul is in a terrible little prison buried underground. And he's only had minimal contact with people from the church. But what he knows of the church is that the whole movement that he's been so involved with starting and all these churches that he's been so involved with planting are sort of falling apart. That a lot of the church leaders at the time, especially in this province of Asia, are coming under the sway of, of bad teaching and false teachers and, and they're abandoning the faith that they started with. And Paul knows that he's not going to survive this stint in prison. He knows he's not going to make it out to go back to those churches and correct them. So 2 Timothy really serves as this final set of written instructions from Paul to his closest co-worker, to his closest disciple. And I think it's really important for us to notice that he focused so much on spreading the gospel and continuing this work that Paul and Timothy had done together. I think that should tell us how urgent and how relevant Paul felt that was to the life of a church that he thought was on the brink of dying. Some of the themes we've seen in 2 Timothy already include that close relationship between Paul and Timothy. We've seen similar encouragements to what we're going to see today back in chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, 15 through 18. We've seen Paul tell Timothy, hey, we worked together and there is a standard that you have received from me and, and I'm asking you to teach up to it. That was verses 13 through 14 of chapter 1. We've seen T Paul tell Timothy, don't be ashamed of the fact that I'm in prison and that you're so close to me. Really this big encouragement not to be ashamed to stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted, which in the modern world numbers into the millions. That was chapter 1 verses 8 through 12. And today, we get two more encouragements from Paul. And the first one is simply Paul telling Timothy, God will make you strong. God will make you strong enough to do this. Chapter 2, verse 1 in English begins with these words, you therefore. In Greek, it's you un. 
Now that doesn't mean much to you, I understand. it. Believe me, it doesn't mean much to me either. But we know that in Greek, that phrase that we translate in English as you therefore is actually written sort of as a point of emphasis. But to know what Paul is emphasizing, what, what he's trying to tell Timothy, we actually have to take a couple of steps back and revisit the end of chapter 1 so that we know what Paul is referring to at the beginning of chapter 2. Remember in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15-18, through 18, this is a paraphrase of what's there. Paul writes to Timothy that these churches in Asia are falling away from us. The way Paul words it is, they've, they've abandoned me. They've turned on me. They're following these other teachers. But there are some, some hopeful and, and faithful believers yet. There's this Onesiphorus who's not ashamed of the fact that I'm in prison. In fact, he's come to visit me and he's been such a refreshing friend to me. And that's a little bit about what, what Mike talked about last Sunday. That refreshing relationship that Paul enjoyed with Onesiphorus even while he was in prison. So that's how chapter 1 ends. So when chapter 2 starts and Paul writes this, you therefore, he's emphasizing the points he made in chapter 1. What he's really saying is, look, the situation's dire. We've had some churches fall away. He gave an example of, of this one friend, this one believer who has remained loyal. And now, as a point of emphasis, he says, okay, now you, Timothy, so you be like this. Be like Onesiphorus. Be strong. Be the one who's going to stand by me again, just like this other guy did. Again, it's, it's a phrase that you could pass over really simply, but it, it's a point of emphasis for Paul, the way he originally wrote it. He sets all this stuff up at the end of chapter 1 and starts chapter 2 by saying, okay, so you be like this. You decide now what you're going to do. 2 Timothy chapter 1 frames why this little phrase at the beginning of chapter 2 is so necessary and so important. Paul is really telling Timothy what he, what he needs to understand and what he needs to do. He's telling him, we have some friends left, but we have to realize that our church is in danger. Our church is in peril. So you, you my child, you have to be strong now. It's time for you to step up. It's time for you to take all of the all of the blessings that you have and all of the stuff that you've learned from working with me and go and be strong. This is the exact moment in verse 1 that we get to this passing of the baton. That's why we called this message passing the baton. Paul frames his relationship with Timothy with that, that father-son language yet again. He's been doing that a lot in these letters to Timothy. He does it Especially in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he calls him my beloved child. So, thinking of their relationship in that, that father-son sort of mind, you have to think that this is Paul telling someone he considers to be like his son, or he considers to be like his actual son, it's time for you to be strong. It's time for you to to step up and step into this church that's in danger. It's on you now to do this work. I'm in prison and I'm not getting out. I'm not going to be able to go back to these churches that are falling away. This is up to you now. It's time for you to be strong and step into this. It tells us a lot, I think, about the state of the ministry that they did together. It tells us a lot, I think, about the state of the church. A lot about the faith that Paul had in Timothy and a little bit about their relationship together. But to really, to really bring it home to us, I want you to think, those of you who have a child, what would it take for you to get down on their level and tell them, it's time now for you to be strong. It's time now for you to step up and step into this. If you don't have kids... You certainly had parents. Was there ever a time that they had to say that to you? It's time now for you to be strong. This scene that I hope we're all envisioning is not one that tends to come along when things are really good. 
when the family's doing really well and everything's going the way it's supposed to, when the business is doing well and it's making money, that's not typically when we look to those around us and grab them by the shoulders and say, okay, it's time now for you to be strong. It's time for you to step into this. I don't have kids. I had two parents. And I can remember the one instance when one of my parents had to come to me and say something like this to me. It was actually when they were splitting up. And they knew that it wasn't going to be easy for anybody. It was going to be ugly. And it was going to be loud. And it was going to be invasive. And one of them came to me and said, okay, it's time now for you to be strong and to step up and to pick up the slack and to step into this. It's never a phrase that we go to again in a season where everything's good. So if we can agree that this is really what Paul is telling Timothy, you therefore be strong, be made strong, step into this, we really start to understand that the church is not doing well, that their ministry is not doing well, but that Paul has all the faith in the world in his beloved son as he passes this baton to him to go and do the work that is so badly needed. Now again, it, it, Paul chose that father-son imagery. I'm not imposing that on Scripture. This is how Paul thinks about his relationship with Timothy. I'd like to just stay there for a minute. The household of the people of God at the time this was written, is in trouble. The family business is not doing so well. And the dad can't be there to fix it. The leader that the church has relied on since his conversion to Christianity can't be there to set things right. This is a dad going to his son and saying, it's up to you now. I can't do this anymore. This belongs to you now. You have to take ownership of this. You have to be strong enough to do this. And I just want you to think for a moment, if you're still hanging on to that thought about what it would take for you to say that to one of your children, think for a moment about how you would feel saying that to one of your children. Or to be told that by one of your parents. That, that tension that would exist in that moment, mixed with a little bit of excitement, because something is about to change, mixed with a little bit of fear, all of the feelings that are there in that moment, I think we find here in these two verses of this letter. I think that's, that's, the, that's the mode, that's the, the mood that we have to think of when we come to this scene. But, I said this was an encouragement, so it's not all discouraging, it's not all bad news. Paul makes it clear to Timothy that he's not alone. The second part of verse 1 reads, Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the Greek, the word reads, Endunamu, which is a Greek verb that means be strong. Right? It comes from this root word, dunamis, which means power or strength. But it's written, it's not written in an what we would call an active voice in the world of language arts and studies. It's not written in a way that says, be strong. It's actually written in what they call a passive voice, which is when something is, is more done to you. So the really proper way to translate it is, be made strong or be strengthened. Which means that this, this part of the verse, this phrase reads is, be made strong by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So if Paul starts by saying, it's time for you to be strong, it's time for you to be the guy to step up and be involved in this, he's telling him, you don't have to do it alone. You're going to be made strong by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. It's not on Timothy alone to do this. It's not that he has to wake up tomorrow and be a different person or, or somehow make himself stronger. This is something he's going to be made into by the power of God. It calls back to what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6-7. through For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 
And what is this if not Paul telling Timothy, there is a spirit within you that is not calling you to be timid, that is not calling you to be weak, but it's a spirit that's given you certain gifts and it's time now for you to seize on those and use them in a way that's powerful and affects change. This spirit makes you strong. And if you don't believe it from Paul, you can go back to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, and see Jesus saying it Himself. Jesus phrased it this way, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then of course, there's Jesus' promise that comes to us in the final words of Matthew's Gospel, the tail end of the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, sort of the second part of it, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All of these verses systematically come to us and tell us that yes, there is a Holy Spirit here. There is a Holy Spirit inside of every saved believer. That the Spirit is not dormant, it is living. That the Spirit is not vague and ineffectual, that it has power. That it gives power to the believer for a very specific purpose, to be the witnesses of Jesus Christ. All of that leads us back to where we are in 2 Timothy, where we find Paul telling Timothy, this Spirit is within you. The Spirit is going to make you strong. And there's a little bit more to the story too because Paul didn't just say that and leave it at that. Paul tells Timothy that you're going to be empowered by the Spirit to stay strong, but that this strength is rooted in the salvation you receive from Jesus. Remember he says you're going to be made strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That most often refers to our salvation. Timothy is to be strengthened specifically by Jesus' grace. Now we'll cheat a little bit and skip ahead to to 2 Timothy 2, verses 8-10, through which we're not supposed to preach on for another couple weeks, but we'll visit them now. Because Paul refers to this in those verses. He writes, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel for which I am suffering bound with chains as a criminal. But the Word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. When he speaks about being made strong, he speaks about remembering Jesus Christ risen from the dead. He says that he's suffering for this Gospel bound as chains as a criminal but that the Word of God is not bound. Therefore, right? there's a cause-effect relationship here. Because Paul knows that Jesus was risen from the dead, and he knows that the Word of God can't be bound with chains, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect. What Paul is telling us is that his strength to endure this, his strength to be locked down in prison knowing that he will die there, His strength to go through all of that for the sake of other believers comes from His remembrance that Jesus is indeed alive, that He has conquered death, and that the Word of God can't be held down in a physical prison. It can't be held down with chains. That is the source of Paul's Paul's strength according to Paul. And he's telling Timothy, this is the strength that you'll find in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. With minds and hearts focused on Jesus, remembering always that yes, death has has indeed been conquered, that the worst possible thing that can happen to you at the end of this life is that you wake up at the feet of Christ, which is a pretty good deal, I'd say. If you remember that and your heart and mind are focused on that, you can bring the Word of Jesus to any place in any situation. It's not bound with chains. It moves in ways that are powerful. It transforms lives all over the world. Through seminary, I've had the privilege of meeting missionaries and pastors and teachers who go to remote jungles and face down witch doctors and come back and have stories to tell about people being saved. The Word is indeed not bound within any borders. It's not bound within any prison. It is alive. 
It is powerful. And it is a movement that we should all feel, I think, an obligation, not just an encouragement, an obligation to be a part of. We can indeed endure everything because we've been saved, because of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Remember the last time I got to be up here talking about 2 Timothy, I, I tried to make the point that salvation means a lot more than just sort of getting heaven. That sanctification is a part of salvation, that being made more like Christ is a part of our salvation. That salvation means we've been saved not just from the grave, but from the chains that sin puts on us. We've been saved from, from any need to, to meet cultural and social expectations because all of that is secondary to our pursuit of the kingdom of God. You get saved from all of that stuff. It's, it's not just getting heaven, although that's a big part of it. It's being saved from sin. It's being saved from that that anxiety that might stop you from sharing the Word. You have a source of strength that empowers you to go beyond all of that stuff. And it's the Holy Spirit, and it's the salvation from Christ Jesus. This is a source of strength for Timothy. It's a source of strength for Paul. It's a source of strength for every believer who truly knows what it means to be saved. We have strength to do this, to suffer for the gospel like Paul does, to spread the gospel in all places like that early church did. And we know it comes to us from two sources, the spirit that lives within us and the knowledge of our salvation and everything that that means. Again, I want you to remember what the church is like at this part of our story, at this part of the new... And it is our story. This is us. This is our family. If you walk around long enough, you're going to meet some of these folks in heaven, I'll bet. And I want you to remember what the church, what the family was like at this part of the story. It was in trouble. Loser, leaders were losing sight of the gospel that they started with. There were bad teachers emerging in different parts of the church and spreading around some bad theology. The church was being persecuted and some were renouncing their faith. They were being brought before government officials and essentially told, well, renounce or be killed. And some, some took the first option. It was time for Timothy, in the midst of all this, to step up and to be strong because the family was in trouble, the family business was in trouble. And I would go so far as to say that the encouragement that's here for us remains the same. It's time for us to step up and to be strong. It's time for us to hear that encouragement from our, our fathers to step up and be strong and step into this and take hold of this and make sure it succeeds. We're in charge of this now. Jesus builds and leads His church. I have no doubts about that, but He does it through His people. I will say definitively, it is time for us, not just as Rock Ridge Church, but as the global church, but you guys are here, so you're the ones who are hearing it. It is time for us to step up and to be strong and to make sure this thing gets handed off to the next generation and is going to survive and is going to thrive. I do believe that the church will be on the cultural margins in this country within the next hundred years. There's a research firm that does a lot of research for Christian groups called the Barna Foundation. You may have heard studies or statistics from them before. Back in 2014, they did a big nationwide survey about how important church and faith were to people. They found only 36% of Americans in a national survey reported any church attendance whatsoever, and that a large portion of that 36% were people who attended on only two days in the calendar year. Can you guess what they are? Christmas and Easter. I had an old boss, he called those people creasters. Because they only came on Christmas and Easter. They were creasters. The millennial generation among those surveyed failed to see church not just as important, but as a morally good thing. They did not view the church as an organization, as the worldwide capital C church. They did not see it as a morally good 
organization. Now that's either something we hear and we condemn them and we say, well, they've never been to church. What do they know? Oh, look how crazy they are thinking about the church that way. Or it's something that condemns us and says, well, maybe in some instances the church has lost its vision a little bit. And maybe it's been involved historically in things that it, it didn't need to be. According to our own conference that this church belongs to, the North American Baptist Conference, 70% of Americans right now would not come to church on their own. 30% would. The other 70% would need to be invited by a friend or encouraged by a family member, and maybe you'd get them in the door. I'm not saying that the church is going to be gone. I'm not saying that the church is going to be knocked down and destroyed. This is not some apocalyptic prophecy of persecution and opposition and oppression that ends church life as we know it or somehow forces us underground. That is not what I'm talking about when I say the church is going to be on the cultural margin in the next hundred years. What I am saying is that we will likely not be the cultural majority. We will not be a cultural superpower a hundred years from now. I do think that's a real possibility. The data seems to indicate that we're moving down that track. If we can agree that that's even likely, if we can agree that it's even a real, imaginable possibility that a hundred years from now, maybe one in a thousand people will step up and say, I'm a Christian, I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we can agree that that's likely, then we have a lot of work to do. If we can agree that that's likely, then the family business is a little bit in trouble. Maybe not right now. Maybe the stock price is okay now. But we can look ahead a few generations and see that we might be bound for something less than the absolute best. That's why I say in this season, just like when Paul wrote this to Timothy, this is a season where the church and its people needs to, to step up and to be strong. It's time for members of this family, this, both this one specifically and the global family we belong to, to be strengthened by that spirit that's inside of us and by our knowledge that we are saved people. This is on us. When we became believers, we took some, some small part in ownership of this. Yes, we're following Jesus' lead, but again, He most often acts through His people. We own some small part of this. We're responsible for it. It's time for us to take ownership of it, to be strong and to make sure that it thrives not just for this generation, but for the one that's a hundred years from now. Just as Paul told Timothy, son, it is time for you to be strong. It is time for you to step into this. This is me telling you, if you view me at all, as your shepherd, if you view me at all as a spiritual relative, as anything more than your sort of stately Bible professor who gets to talk to you on certain Sundays, this is me as your beloved friend, brother, spiritual dad, if you want to think of it that way, shepherd telling you, children, sons, daughters, it is time for all of us to be strong and to step into this and make good use of the ownership that we have of this. You're going to ask me how. I don't have all the answers, but I have some ideas. Practicing good stewardship. How are the gifts and talents that we've been blessed with being used to advance the gospel message? Do we as individual believers understand what our strengths and resources are? And are we thinking about good and creative ways to use them for the glory of the kingdom of God? Hospitality. Do people who you know, family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, uh, workplace proximity associates, however you think of them, do the people who you know and interact with benefit from having a Christian, that is you, in their lives? Is it an overall good that they know someone who believes 
in Jesus Christ? Or does it have no effect at all? You know, a big part of the reason why that 70% won't come to church, and a big part of the reason why those millennials surveyed probably said the church is, is not a moral good, they've likely not had a positive relationship with a believer that lasted over time, that was fruitful, that they were really involved with. Hospitality is a big push to end that trend. Really think about it. Do people who you know benefit from having a Christian in their Rolodex? And if they don't, how might that change? Prayer. Do we pray for the church? Do we pray for its leaders? Do we pray for its future? And I say it's leaders, I mean guys like, like me and Mike, I mean life group leaders, I mean worship leaders. Do we pray for the people who we trust to be responsible to make this work? Do we pray for the church, lower capital C and big capital C, Rockridge specifically and the global church? Do we pray for its future? Do we understand why prayer is powerful for the future of the church? Evangelism. How do we talk about God and the Bible with people? When we talk about the Bible, do we talk about it in a way that says, I trust that this is the Word of God and that it really means something for my life? I trust that there's real answers in here? I trust that it's, it's relevant and powerful and has something to say about my life and about the life of others. When we talk about our relationship with God, do we, do we express the transformative power that God has had in the lives of everyone who's here? Or do we talk about God as sort of this vague and, and far off spiritual grandfather who we met once and haven't seen in a long time? Would someone watch you even without words? Would someone watch you and understand that this is how a Christian goes through life? That this is how someone who believes in and leans on the power of Jesus Christ handles things? Would they watch you and see that in a good way? Discipleship. It's a big word around here. Do you have an intentional relationship with someone where you're investing in one another, and the goal is not just being good friends, but I would hope that you do along the way, but the goal is that you would become more active, more fully developed servants of Jesus. Now, if you want an opportunity to have a relationship like that, and I hope that you all do, or even just to learn more about it, maybe to get better at it, join a life group. Join a life group. We're going to be doing a lot of work in that area in the coming months. And I pray that more than I've ever seen in my time at this church, we see people invigorated and inspired and empowered to sign up and say, yes, I am going to, in a very covenant, intentional way, go do life with some fellow believers. Church is going to mean something more than Sunday morning. Or, if a life group isn't quite your speed right now, get one to two other people and pick up this resource that we've been trying to sell you on for months called Discipleship Essentials. It really is a powerful tool that guides you back into the Scriptures, that asks you questions about how do you think about Scripture, how do you feel about Scripture, all with the intentional goal of getting you to be a more active discipler, and a more active disciple. Go through it with someone. Go through it with two people. And really see it through to the end. It might take you a year or more to do it. But it's going to be a powerful and beautiful process. These are the ways I think that we can better step into this. That we can step up. That we can be strong. That we can experience being made strong. These aren't all of the ways to do it. I certainly don't profess to have even a large fraction of the answers, but these are some thoughts I had while I was praying over this message and thinking about it, and I hope that they meant something to you, and if you can think of any more ways to add to this list, come and tell me what they are. 
we get a second encouragement from Paul to Timothy. It's very similar to something Jesus said once. Go and make disciples. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Remember that Paul was Timothy's teacher. Timothy had heard Paul preach the gospel many times to many people in many different places. Paul's insistence that Timothy continue their work on his own, just as Paul had showed him and told him, is a major theme of this entire book of 2 Timothy. So when Paul refers back to what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, he's reminding him of all the work that they've done together. Timothy, remember, had served as Paul's stand-in, his proxy during their time together, meaning that he had had to take Paul's work and replicate it a few times in the past. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 10, Paul mentioned that he was sending Timothy to the church at Corinth, or at least that he wanted to, and he implored them to treat Timothy well because he's doing the Lord's work just as Paul was. In Philippians, Paul mentions sending Timothy to that church as well. In Philippi, chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, he wrote this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father... He has served with me in the gospel. It was time now for Timothy not just to replicate Paul's work again, not just to do Paul's work, but to hand it off to others. Timothy was to keep working according to the pattern and standard that he learned from Paul. We see that referred to in chapter 1, verse 13 of 2 Timothy. But now he's being charged with something else. Now he's being given this task of teaching that standard to other people. This is a critically important task that Paul has given Timothy. Why? Because this is how the church reproduces. Yeah, faith is handed down through families, but not through birth. Your child was not born a Christian just because you were. It was not written into your genetic code and given to them like the color of your eyes or whether or not your earlobes are attached. It was something that they had to know. It was something that they had to understand. Making disciples, that is teaching the standard, like Paul phrases it, is how the church grows. It's how this generation gives rise to the next generation of believers. It's how we make sure that this gospel that we've heard preached in front of many witnesses is preserved and kept alive for the next generation. And you can see it in this piece of Scripture. We actually have four generations of church reproduction at work right here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. It went from Jesus to Paul in Acts chapter 9. It went from Paul to Timothy in Acts chapter 16. That's where they first met. That's where Paul said, hey buddy, you're on the team. And then he circumcised him, which must have been an interesting day. It goes from Timothy to faithful men who will be able to teach. Remember, that's, that's the new job. That's the new wrinkle that shows up in the job that Paul gives to Timothy. Give this to other people who will be able to teach. So it goes from Timothy to able men or able believers. And finally, it's implied by that that it's going to go from these faithful people to others. That it's going to be handed down from Timothy to able teachers, and then those able teachers will give it to someone else. Timothy is charged now with passing on this gospel on to men who will be able to teach others. It's a command not just to work up to the standard, not just to be strong, but to take everything he knows and everything he's experienced about Jesus and about what the church is and about how to do this and hand it off to another generation of believers. This is church reproduction in action. And it's right here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is still how the church reproduces. This is still how new believers are made. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 was Paul telling his son to step up and be strong. This is what he has to step up and do. Go and train others to do what we've been doing together all this time. Make sure that this thing that we belong to, this gospel that we love with our entire lives, lives on. We can see that concept, I think, repeated even with things that aren't the gospel, if that that helps you to understand it. You have a certain skill, you have a certain belief, you hand it off to another person. Maybe it's your child, maybe it's a sibling or a friend, and then it gets handed off again and again and again, and it reproduces. I told you guys earlier that it's time for this church family too, and I would say this to any church, but it's time for this family too to step up and step into this. We know now what exactly it is that we have to step up into, what after we've been made strong we have to do. And that's to go and train others to do what we've been doing. Knowing, loving, celebrating Jesus. Serving our communities in His name for His purposes. Living the Christian life. Understanding the Christian way of life. Understanding Christian ethics. Living all of that and living it well. Reproduction brings life. If we stop doing that, we die. This family, the global family, big and small, if that reproductive mechanism stops, this stops. It's this concept, this idea, this reproductive method of the church, how we make new believers, how the next generation is formed and shaped as Christians. It's that idea that's always framed for me two of Jesus' parables, the parable of the sower and the parable of the talents. I'll read for you the sower. The talents is a bit longer. This is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1-9. through 9. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up. But since they had no depth of soil, when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus explained the parable in Matthew 13, verses 18 through 23, and he says that the good soil is the one who hears the word and understands it. The one who hears the word and understands it is the one who yields fruit. It's the one who receives the word and then a product is made. Something comes of it. Something that has depth and roots. It reproduces. It produces and it reproduces. The good soil, the one who understands the word, is the one who receives it and gives rise to something else. The one who receives it and reproduces and brings new life. It eventually gives rise to an entire generation of new things. And then there's the parable of the talents. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through, four, 14 through 30. You know the parable already. There's three servants. And they all receive some of their master's wealth. One buries it because he's afraid of what's going to happen. And he gets condemned and thrown into the outer darkness. One invests a little and he gets rewarded. And then one invests a lot and he does it really well. And he gets rewarded even more. The two successful servants, the two who are, who are blessed by their master when he comes back and sees the work they've done, are those who take what is given to them and entrusted to them. I'm remembering right now that Paul called the gospel the deposit entrusted to you when he wrote to Timothy. There might be something to that. But they take the deposit that's entrusted to them. 
And they went and they invested it in others and it reproduced and it made more. They were good stewards of the blessing that had given to them. They took it, they invested it, and they made more of it. Like the good soil, they took this gift that they received from their master and they faithfully invested it in something else and it increased. It reproduced, as it were. Now, are these parables that Jesus told primarily about discipleship and evangelism? Maybe not. I said that that concern is how it frames my reading of it. But I do think that the reproductive action of the church that is the making of new believers, it's something that is really important to me. And because of that, it, it colors the way that I read these parables a little bit. But I hope that you can see at least a thread of that in these parables now that we've talked about it a little bit. And I hope that in the way we've talked about these two parables, and, and again, I admit that my reading of them is a little bit colored because I do care a lot about this, but I hope that you can see what I'm getting at. And I hope you can see what I see in these parables. I hope it inspires you a little bit to read them in a way that's similar the next time you come across them in your Scripture study. When you read these parables, remember the kind of soil that you're supposed to be like, the kind of soil that Jesus likes is the good one. And the kind of servant you're supposed to be like is the productive one. The ones that take the deposit that was entrusted to them, invested it, and allowed it to reproduce. And there's one more piece of scripture that for me is colored by all of this. Remember earlier I read you the last words of the Great Commission. Now we're going to hear the whole thing. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What is this great commission if not a command from Jesus to His church to go and reproduce? Go then and make disciples is a directive back to the reproductive mechanism of this church. Go and make new believers. Train up faithful people who will take this and give it to someone else participate in the reproduction of Jesus' church by making sure that your relationships with people are intentional, that they're beneficial, that the Christian life is expressed in the way that you live it and the way that you treat others, that when you talk about God in the Bible, it really means something. It means something that's true and good. This great commission is our command to reproduce as believers, which is exactly what Paul was telling Timothy to do in chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. But that encouragement is also there, that you're not doing this alone, that this is not going to be just the result of your many talents and your nice smile, that you are empowered by the Spirit that lives within you to do this, that you have been made strong and will be made strong to do this. As the band joins us again, thank you band, we'll consider our next step. First, be strengthened. Pray every day this week and thank God for the power that you already have through the Spirit to be His witness. Second, entrust this to faithful people. Make a short list of people who you'd like to have a discipleship relationship with. Who you'd like to sit across the table with and talk in a way that is intimate and powerful about Jesus, His effect on your life, and the truth of His Word. Pick one person from that short list and actually go and ask them if they would like to talk to you a little bit more about who Jesus is. In just a moment, our ushers are going to come forward. 
collect our offering. I would appreciate it if you joined me in a word of prayer before they walk the aisles. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you for for Paul who wrote this. I thank you for Timothy who received it. Lord, I thank you for the relationship that they had that allowed this work to be done. And in its infancy, when it looked like your church was going to wander away from the right path, you used these guys in a way that was so powerful and so meaningful that your gospel was preserved, that the doctrines of your church were preserved and kept true, that your church was allowed to, allowed to flourish and grow around the world by believers reproducing and making new believers. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for giving us a gospel that is so powerful and so transformative and yet easy enough to share. Thank you for giving us a gospel that when we share it with someone, we don't have to tell them, yeah, you're going to have to jump through hoops, X, Y, and Z. We get to tell them all you have to do is realize who Jesus is and accept Him as your Savior and everything else will come after that. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a gospel that is powerful and communicable. Lord, I just pray that this church, this family here at Rock Ridge, would be part of a, a global movement of people who realize that they can be strengthened to do this, who realize that Acts 1-8 is true, that we have this spirit, we have this power for a purpose so that we can go and make new believers. Lord, I pray that this prediction, this, this thing that comes from data, this idea that we're going to be culturally marginal in a hundred years doesn't come true because at this moment we have a family of people who are so passionately empowered to go and make new believers that it doesn't happen. I pray, Lord, that we would be strengthened, that we would step up and take ownership of this and do this. And Lord. I know that that's the way you're leading us. I guess, Lord, I pray that we simply become good followers and follow your lead. Lord, I pray for our offering today that it would empower this church to continue to do what it does, the missionary work, that it would give us even more power to be a presence for, for good, for your truth here in this community. Lord, I thank you for every person here today. I thank you for every heart that has thought about this message even for a second. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of worship. I pray that you receive it from us. It's beautiful music. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.